Welcome to the bonus part of our discussion regarding quality assessment and performance improvement. In this section, we will be discussing more on the external quality assessment programs. The laboratory may participate on a voluntary or mandatory basis in external programs initiated through the laboratory community, such as proficiency testing, accreditation and licensure activities and hospital programs such as PRO, risk management, JCAHO, Medicare, and facility licensing. This topic class focuses on laboratory-based programs and the other plans as part of the indicators of the overall quality performance of the institution. External quality assessment programs may be roughly divided into two types for review purposes. One, proficiency surveys, in which blind specimens are sent by an external agency for analysis and comparison with other laboratories. And two, licensure and accreditation programs, which involve on-site inspections. The line between these two groups is often blurred because they are so closely intertwined, but the division provides a means for review. Accreditation and licensure plans, for example, may frequently produce their own proficiency surveys or use participation in these plans as a major evaluation criterion. Possible conflicts of interest arise from the requirement that only the proficiency survey products of a specific inspection agency are acceptable. Frequent complaints are also expressed over the interpretation and enforcement of arbitrarily set successful performance levels by some government licensure agencies despite disclaimers issued by almost all proficiency plans that the results should not be used as a sole indicator or assessor of performance because of the intended design and unreliability of the material for this purpose. Proficiency surveys are programs that allow a laboratory to compare its performance on a common sample with a group of peers based on size, like number of beds or the number of specimen volume, and methodology like the instrument and reagents used. The most widely known programs are those issued by the American Association of Bioanalysts or the AAB and the College of American Pathologists or CAP. Some state health departments may produce specialty proficiency material for monitoring syphilis or infant thyroid testing facilities. Most suppliers of commercial quality control samples also include as part of the report the interlaboratory comparison statistics. These organizations offer a variety of surveys which can be tailored to the specific requirements and needs of each laboratory based on the sophistication and extent of services offered. Survey material may range from basic packages for physician office laboratories or satellite testing stations to comprehensive options for the highly specialized procedures performed in areas like toxicology and microbiology. Although the selection and enrollment in a proficiency survey service may be theoretically voluntary, participation is normally required for accreditation and licensure. The failure to meet designated performance criteria or to demonstrate appropriate Corrective action may lead to sanctions including loss of accreditation or license. In addition to providing an objective means to assess the effectiveness of internal quality control procedures, the studies provide the laboratory community with information about the performance of different methods and instruments. This allows managers and manufacturers to make more informed selection and marketing decisions. In simpler terms, proficiency surveys are activities by accredited organizations in order to assess the laboratory if they are competent or not. Next is licensure and accreditation programs or the laboratory inspection. 
The laboratory may justifiably feel bombarded with a multitude of entities seeking to inspect its facilities. This may range from those seeking voluntary compliance with professional standards to the local code inspector looking to enforce fire and safety regulations. Often rules and missions may appear redundant or even in conflict. A complaint shared by the laboratory with all business organizations. The American Association of Blood Banks and the College of American Pathologists are two professional laboratory organizations that have been leaders in offering inspection and accreditation programs. Both provide extensive educational and resource material about their review processes, including accreditation standards and inspection guidelines. This information has proved useful for developing and monitoring quality management plans for the laboratory, as well as preparing for site inspection. JCAHO is also part of its accreditation programs. Their main mission is to maintain standards for the laboratory and also includes a designated member of their site visit team to review the laboratory. In addition to these professional activities, the laboratory has also attracted increasing regulatory interest at both federal and state levels, most notably for CLIA 88 and Medicare certification. Driven by the criticisms and complaints about redundancy and costs, many of the government and private inspection agencies are working on reciprocal, equivalency, and deemed status agreements or attempting to coordinate site visits to avoid frequent repetitious inspection of the same services. However, because of territorial issues, which is not an uncommon characteristic of most organizations, right? The progress in this area has been very slow, especially among competing laboratory organizations. To give you an overview of accreditation and licensing, you all know that everything needs to get a permit and a license. Opening up fast food chains or even small online businesses needs a permit to ensure that your services are really acceptable and at the same time your food is safe and edible let's say for example if it's food that you are trying to sell but in the laboratory setup class they need to make sure that the laboratory that you are working or you are owning can produce quality accurate and precise results so they have to test the proficiency of the employees as well as the reagents used for the machines and instruments within that laboratory. So that is the primary reason why licensing and accreditation and even proficiency surveys are done in the laboratories. Let us also proceed to the indicators of quality performance. Under institutional programs class, our discussion of quality management has, up to this point, reviewed programs with which the laboratory evaluates itself. The laboratory has also begun to play an increasing role, starting with the advent of quality assurance and the indicators of care in the assessment of the overall care that patients receive in the hospital. This has happened because of the type of information the laboratory provides and its relative ease of quantification and monitoring potential. This role has coincided with the renewed realization that the laboratory success can be measured only within the context of the total care received by the patient. The laboratory's increasing participation in these institutional programs is reflected in the JCAHO's Quality Assessment and Improvement and Continuous Performance Improvement Programs. Remember class that QANI and CPI has been previously discussed already to you, so I hope you can remember all of those. 
We also have discussed the issues associated with caring for and receiving reimbursements for patients covered by their insurance, such as Medicare, Medicaid, and so on. The major hospital-based quality activities and their historical transition will also be discussed right now. Utilization Review and Peer Review Organizations The thing that I will be explaining to you is usually in an American context where their federal government aligned with the states has devised programs that are designed to assess the quality of care delivered and provide some means of cost containment for the patients enrolled in their plans. This means what again, class? Insurance. Health insurance, right? These efforts and their terminology have followed a route similar to that of quality management. Beginning as a utilization review, so you, this is a utilization review plan in 1966, local physician communities were required to review the medical necessity of care with the main focus of reducing the patient's length of stay in the hospital. In 1972, noting the failure of utilization review to curtail rising health care costs, the Congress made major changes and passed a law providing for professional standards review organizations. So that's PSRO. Professional Standards Review Organizations. This act class emphasized cost containment and strengthened the role of individual physicians' participation in developing local norms, criteria, and standards of care in a peer review process. Many of the methods for assessing the total quality of care received by patients and identifying indicators of the quality of performance by the institution were developed under the PSRO program. What is the PSRO program again? It is Professional Standards Review Organizations. This was particularly true of techniques for identifying records for chart audits and guidelines for utilization review committees. Ten years later, as part of the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, or the TEFRA, last year, 1982, the same act that ushered in diagnosis-related groups, PSRO was replaced by peer review organizations. This means the timeline of this is, what again? Utilization review, but utilization review failed, so they made professional standards review organizations, and then they change it to peer review organizations. Under TEFRA, this peer review organizations program moved from a local orientation to a single contracted PRO association responsible for an entire state or region. The current program is based on the peer review organization review of a nationwide beneficiary-specific sample representing about 10% of the patients enrolled in federally sponsored plans. This action does not relieve the local hospital of conducting utilization review studies. On the contrary, this activity and its methods are still a major part of the overall quality management program of hospitals required to meet JCAHO and state standards and to defend or challenge reimbursement decisions made by the peer review organizations. The federally mandated PRO for each region is charged with reviewing hospital case records for quality of care and reimbursement decisions in the following areas. Can they write this down? Number one, validity of diagnosis and suitability of services provided. Two, completeness, adequacy, and quality of care received by the patient. Three, 
necessity of admission and appropriateness of discharge. 4. Congruous care given to outlier cases. Exceptional cases because either cost of care or length of stay criteria are already exceeded. And lastly, the appropriateness of transfer of patients between facilities. And the last section of indicators of quality performance is critical care pathways. A major hospital-wide quality care management program has developed that places emphasis on the outcomes of treatment received by the patient as the definition of quality. This program is called Critical Care Pathways or Simple Care Paths, C-A-R-E space P-A-T-H-S, Care Paths. Critical Care Pathways or Care Paths was driven by the Total Care Concept Lessons of QA, TQMCQI, PRO, and the Specific Performance Improvement Indicators of QA and ICPI. This plan incorporates all the resources of the health care system into the delivery of an exact series of interventions or treatments that are to be received by the patient in a designated time period in response to a specific set of symptoms. Under the critical care pathways, the patients are expected to respond and progress along a specific care plan. This includes the coordination of both patient-initiated activities such as eating, breathing, exercise, and so on. And treatment plans like the laboratory tests, the medications given, x-rays, physician care, checkup, and so on. Usually, these are all related to a diagnosis-related group classification. For example, a patient manifesting the symptoms of pneumonia, of course, doctors will initially request for a chest x-ray. So, upon the arrival of the patient in the clinic, they will be assessed. And then later on, the doctors will ask for a chest PA. So, this may be performed within an hour of arrival and sputum sample must also be collected for culture and evaluation within two hours. Usually the results of this class will be released around uh, three to five days but if the patient is also requested for a tuberculous sample usually um, the specimen samples will be released like two weeks to two months. So those time frames. But that also depends on the positivity or negativity of the test results class. I think that would be all for external quality assessment programs class. I hope you've learned something extra for today. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day. Don't forget to like and subscribe my channel. Mm -hmm.